Hello everyone, welcome to today's uh, In Conversation. My name's Ritu Dand, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Springer Nature and it's my utmost pleasure to be in conversation with Elizabeth Bick, our very special guest today. So um, many of you will be aware about the, the level of irre irreproducibility in research today and most of this is due to a, a lack of detail in reporting. Um, how experiments are, are undertaken and such that others cannot rep reproduce them without more information. However, there is little doubt that there are also papers with integrity problems where perhaps images have been digitally altered with or without the intent to deceive. Last year, there were 5,500 retractions in the literature and Elizabeth uh, would most certainly have contributed to the, the source investigations that resulted in some of those retractions. So um, Elizabeth started um, her career as a research scientist uh, studying microbiology at Stanford, but more recently, and in particular to uh, molecular biologists, she uh, will be a very familiar face as, um, well, I'm going to call you an image integrity guru, uh, self-taught, um, but an image integrity expert nevertheless. So welcome, Elizabeth, and thank you for, for joining us today. Lovely to have me on, Rito. Uh, I look forward to talking to you. So um, tell me, how, how does one go from being um, a, a, a microbiologist to uh, an integrity sleuth? Uh, well, that was not planned at all. <laughs> it's sort of a uh, coincidence. Just one day I read about plagiarism and I, I uh, did a Google Scholar search for a text I had written. And just by accident, I happened to pick a sentence that I had written, but that somebody else had plagiarized. And that made me very mad and I'm still, you know, I, I, I was so mad that somebody stole my sentence that I started looking into plagiarism. And then just by another coincidence, I found a duplicated image, a photo that had been reused, but in mirror image to represent a different experiment. And that made me even more mad. And so I started doing that as a hobby. I started to look for scientific papers that had duplicated images just wanting to know how often that would occur. And a couple of years ago, I decided to quit my job. I worked in, uh, in biotech, uh, in, in, in a microbiome company, and I quit my job and decided I wanted to do this full time, to, to look at papers, to, to tell, to give talks about science integrity and uh, how to process images and, and how to not cheat. Wow, that's... that's um a pretty radical change in, in career. So what exactly is it that you do? How do you find these um, image integrity issues? I uh, mostly work off of tips. So people send me an email or a direct message on social media asking me to look at particular papers that they think might have problems. So usually it's images, so photos that are duplicated, photos that are perhaps manipulated, so photoshopped. And then I will look at those papers and sometimes I, I agree with the findings and sometimes I don't. But if I find a paper with a problem, if I agree with the problem, then I will search for more papers by those authors, uh, sort of assuming if they did this on purpose, then they might do it again. They might have done it again. So I, I will screen other papers from those uh, authors. And yeah, so I, I'll basically look at scientific papers all day. But instead of looking at the text, I look at the photos. And I do most of it by eye, but I am also using software to help me find duplications. And um, I think the software and I make a good team because sometimes, you know, one finds what the other does not find. And so we, uh, we help each other, I guess finding uh, these problems started when I think 
I, I don't know if there was any software out there. I mean, did you just use things like uh, Photoshop and, and blow images up? Is, is, is that what you did? Or is that just a myth on how people find these things? I, uh, so I did an initial scan of 20,000 papers because I wanted to know how often would you find duplications within these papers or across papers. And uh, that I did all by eye. So this was in uh, 2013, 14, and I was not aware if there was any software that could do that. I, I don't think there was any at that time. So I just did everything by eye and uh, mainly focused on images that were duplicated within a paper. So as you know, a scientific paper could have many different figures, many different panels. And so I would compare all of them, just making screenshots and I would use uh, a preview on a Mac to, you know, it has a couple of sliders so you can enhance a little bit the contrast and, and make some details come out. But yeah, that was all by eye. Um, some people are using Photoshop to do that. I don't even have that. That's a very expensive <laughs> thing to buy. So, uh, you know, I'm working for myself. I don't have that software, but I'm just using preview. And now I'm using software to find the duplication. So that will just extract the images from a PDF and then compare them to each other or to a database that uh, of, of other images. So it sometimes finds reuse of images across papers. Elizabeth, I know how difficult it is to find one duplication or one you know, problem with a, with a gel gloss and, and you screen 20,000 images. <laughs> that, you know, that speaks to your passion and your, your dedication um, to do this. And, and the fact that you've quit your job as a successful researcher and are now doing this full time. Why? <laughs> because I'm, I'm passionate about science and, and for me, science should be about finding the truth. And if you cheat in science, or even if there's an error in a science paper, I feel we should call that out because um, we as scientists, we base our work on the work of other scientists, right? We, we look at papers, we cite them, we base our research on it. And so I feel if I see a problem in a paper, I need to let other people know, not just, you know, publishers or the authors, but also other people. So I am driven, I guess, by a passion to make things right, to use my talent of spotting these things and my experience to, to warn other people and just to you know, not, not to, to harm any careers, but to, to let other people know there might be a potential problem with this figure or with this paper. And you should, um, yeah, you know, be aware if you want to base your research on this figure or this paper, that there might be a problem with it. As a, as a publisher, um, we take our job as guardians of the literature really seriously. And um, we want to be sure that the, the record is intact and, and, and accurate. Um, the only difference is uh, we're all, you know, sort of, it's our day job. You've made it your day job, but it, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't always your day job. So, you know, the, the passion um, absolutely stands out uh, with what you say and what you do. And I guess, you know, as a researcher myself, many years ago, but I was a researcher, you know, science is based on integrity. Um, science is based on reproducibility. Um, you know, I, I, all science, people build on science. So if um, science isn't reproducible, if you um, commit fraud or your research is inaccurate, at some point, one day, somebody will, will, will call you out um, and it will be apparent, perhaps not as quickly as it is when we have people like you and, and others now uh, joining you in this quest. But eventually it will be known um, amongst um, the community. So I think this is something all researchers know. I think it's something that, you know, we were trained up with and why do you think that people still do this? Why do you think this happens? 
I think people cheat because it makes your results look better. And, uh, you know, if you if your results are not quite as nice as you had hoped or you have, let's say, 500 samples and one of them is just messing up your results and you take it out and now suddenly with that one sample removed, your results look better. I think it's a very tempting thing to do, to leave out that one outlier or to change a value from, so the sample becomes from a negative, a positive, um, or to Photoshop a lot of, a couple more cells into your picture. So it looks like there's more cells in there. Um, if your results look better, it's easier to publish. I, I, I think we all know this. If your results are beautiful and shiny and, and uh, attractive, it's just easier to publish. And so people need to publish papers and we all feel that pressure to publish as scientists. But there are also some countries that have very strict regulations uh, and there's people working in labs who, where the, the lab, uh, the professor, the leader of the group might be a very demanding person, perhaps a big personality and you know have a, has a great ego and i think if you work in a lab where there's a lot of pressure from above from your professor your your manager to give them the results they want i think if you are especially a junior researcher earlier in your career you might be tempted to cheat just to please the professor just to get out of that lab with a nice publication and and so because we as scientists we focus so much on metrics, like how many papers did you publish? Uh, how, you know, what is the number of times you were cited? What is the, your age index? All these metrics do not necessarily make uh, or tell you if a person is a great scientist, but, but it's easy to focus on them. Uh, you know, the people sometimes online will say, oh, you only have 40 papers. I have published 4,000 papers and, you know, does that make a person a better scientist? No, I don't think so. And, but yeah, some people like to focus on that. And some people are, like I said, bullied into doing that. So there's many reasons that drive people to do misconduct. And I'm aware that in some of these cases, or perhaps even most of these cases, people are in very sad circumstances and they do it as a way out. Perhaps they are planning to leave academia, but they just want to have that, that nice, nice publication. I mean, you did mention a lot of different reasons for why this happens. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the reasons which um, is sort of selectively seeing uh, what you want to see, um, uh, you know, sort of taking that group of, you know, results in a cluster of many, which enhances your uh, hypothesis or, or whatever, that there is certainly um, uh, an element of, of, of that taking place. And so over your career as, a, as an integrity sleuth, I, I wouldn't even want to put a number on the, on the number of papers that you have uh, looked at. But how many of them would you estimate to be genuine fraud with intent to deceive versus either excessive beautification or, you know, selective, you know, not from the get-go intent to deceive or, or fraud. Do, do you have an idea of the, the level of um, sort of papers that are in that? I, I would I would hope it, it's much, much smaller than the, the rest, but, you know, you, you, you have experience. Yeah, so I looked at a set of 20,000 papers, um, uh, you know, about um, 10 years ago. And in that set, we found 4% of papers to have duplicated images. So that means within that paper, there was at least one panel that had, was duplicated in another figure or in the same figure, but a different panel or had duplications within a photo. So all kinds of things and the latter if you have a photo with duplicated elements duplicated cells you see the same cell over and over again or or you have two images that overlap but one of them is rotated that that suggests an intention to mislead so in our set of 20,000 we found 800 papers 
to contain duplications and about half of them, um, so that would be 2% of that set, so, so 400 papers in 20,000, 2% of those papers uh, had duplications that were suggestive for an intention to mislead. But it's really hard to look at a single paper and say, ah, that was done on purpose. Again, if it's a duplicated uh, part of a photo, you know, the, the equivalent of looking at a photo of a, a dinner party and seeing the same person's, you know, one person's head photoshopped on another person's body that looks like it was intentionally done. Um, so 2% so of papers had uh, concerns like that. But of course, there might be many other problems that are not visible. I look at photos, but papers have lots of other types of data, like uh, tables and line graphs. And you know, the, the, the actual amount could be higher than 2%. But uh, yeah, it might be, I don't know, 4 or 5%. I, I think 5% is a reasonable guess. But again, most, most science misconduct most fraudulent data would not be easy to catch just by looking at the paper. I focus on the, the tip of the iceberg. It also means that, you know, 90, maybe 95% of papers does not have an intention to mislead. But who knows, it might be a little bit lower. I, I do want to point out that the majority of papers is written, is, you know, these studies are conducted with uh, all the best intentions. And as scientists, we might make errors. And so some of those might be visible by looking at the paper, but the majority of papers is uh, perhaps not reproducible, but is, is done not with an intention to mislead, but with an intention you know, of doing good science. And there might still be errors, but uh, yeah, I, I still trust science, but I'm focusing on that, that little sliver of papers that have potential problems. I think it's really important that we don't create a research culture because we know that scientists can make genuine errors, can make genuine mistakes. And there are, you know, as, a, as an editor, I've had scientists come forward with their genuine error and, and ask that the paper be retracted. And that's good practice. That's good science. We, we yes. want that to stay. We don't want all restrictions to be associated with this conduct and fraud because they are 100% are not. Yes, some of them may be, but certainly not the majority, I would say, having dealt with uh, retractions in all sorts of areas over the course of my career. Most of them are um, innocent, a, a mistake with a reagent or some other aspect, a genuine error where the researchers have come forward and uh, re retracted the paper. But yes, we, you know, there are... Um, genuine uh, retractions that are down to misconduct and, and that's just a, a fact of life and, and something that, um, you know, probably requires a change in research culture to, to help change. So let's talk a little bit about introducing that change. How, how can we fix this? How can we make it better? Um, funding bodies hold the purse strings which means they have a lot of leverage. Institutes and universities host scientists. Um, again, they have a lot of leverage. Um, and then there's publishers. You know, we are the end in the line, but we also have leverage. Let's start talking about funders and institutes and universities. Do you think there are things that those organizations could do to change the behaviors or affect what we are seeing? Yeah, there's there's many things you can do. I, I guess, I hope that uh, funders and universities focus on, on quality of research and not on quantity. And I, I'm just worried that there seems to be more and more emphasis on, on the quantity of, of papers. Like how many papers did you publish this year or as, a, as a, uh, a graduate student, there's you know, universities that have regulations. You should publish at least two or three papers before you can get your PhD. And I, I think those metrics are just the wrong thing to focus on. So I hope that universities will also give PhD to people who worked really hard, are very smart, but the, you know, the cells didn't want to grow or the, the experiment turned out to be a negative. And those are things worth publishing. 
Um, so there's just a lot of metrics that make a good scientist, but yeah, not, not those, not how many papers did you publish. Um, there should also be more emphasis on holding people accountable. So when people are caught doing fraud, it's very easy for a professor to point fingers at a junior researcher, like, but they did the photoshopping, it wasn't me. And I, I see too many cases where these senior people can keep on frauding. You can just see throughout their career, there's multiple grad students or PhD uh, postdocs who, who might have done the, some photoshopping or some other ways of cheating, but it's, it all happened under their watch. So I feel senior researchers are in the end responsible for the, the, the integrity, the, the culture of their lab. And if those are the ones who are bullying and pressuring people to give them the output they want, they are in the end responsible for it. And too many universities are throwing the junior people under the bus and do not hold the senior people responsible. And especially when you see multiple cases of multiple junior researchers doing bad things, why, you know, that there should be something done about the culture in the lab. And so I, I hope that more and more universities are holding these senior people accountable. That doesn't seem to happen very often. I'm just going to add a caveat to all our, our listeners and watchers that we, we're not saying all senior researchers and professors <laughs> behave in no, this we're... way. Um, and, um, you know, there are many reasons that uh, not all senior researchers have the, the time to go through each data set of every person in their lab, because that is what it takes to, to look at the raw data. <coughs> but I would say that's a, a problem that we have allowed to create. You know, if you work at a company, there is a certain infrastructure in place that means that, um, you know, a group can't be too big to, to be sure that you can have oversight. You know, I, because I went from the research landscape into um, a, a company landscape, I see the differences. You know, a, 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 a PI is, is left to their own devices in terms of learning how to manage the team. Mm -hmm. There are no uh, restrictions on size. You know, however much money you bring in, you're allowed to recruit that many people. We don't have, we don't have, positions for having, um, you know, deputy researchers who are there to support the PI, you know, sort of mm -hmm. stably fixed term, you know, not fixed term, full term positions. Everything is on this two year sort of rotor of in, out, you know, produce, leave. And, you know, I think that is also a big element that leads some PIs to kind of be leading these massive research labs without the facilities and the support to oversee the level of research going on. And, and I think that is a, another aspect that, um, you know, the, the community needs to look at um, changing. But I'm, I'm not going to miss out us as, as publishers. I, I said we are, um, we care deeply about the integrity of the research that's published. Um, we are the last in the line, so I would hope that, uh, you know, things had been sorted out by the time that they, they get to us. But I absolutely agree that we continue to have a role to play. And, and as a publisher, we have invested in a, a lot of things. And I'd, I'd just like to have a, a minute to tell our audience about some of those things. So we we do um, ask for source data on some of our journals, um, source images um, as a deterrent um, almost, um, but also so that we have it for the record. We, we do plagiarism checks on, on all our journals. We are in the process of introducing new image integrity screening on our journals. Um, and we've also just launched more sophisticated screening of text to catch machine generated uh, papers. And for all our journals and editors, we have a, a huge dedicated team, the research integrity team, who support the, the journals and editors that have issues and, and, and guides them 
through um, the, the, the peer review process. Um, so that's some of what we are doing to um, support um, the sort of research publishing language, uh, pa lang uh, landscape and the um, um, integrity of uh, the research that's, that's being published. Is there anything that you think we could do better, Elizabeth? Uh, though I just, I'm, I'm very happy to, to hear all that. And I, I do think that a lot of publishers and smaller journal, uh, like society journals, have stepped up tremendously in the past couple of years. Uh, I'm mostly dealing with older papers, let's say before 2018 um, and, and older, because I think there, uh, there was a period where those measures might not have been that stringent, but I'm... I'm very glad to hear all of that, and um, but but I do think there's a there's a growing net uh, growing networks of organized fake science paper producing uh, organizations, which we call paper mills. I'm sure you're aware of that. I have and, indeed. <laughs> yes, and so so I think this is a growing problem, and you know we need good measures against that. But some of those measures might not be good enough. I mean, we've heard of um, people who will circumvent plagiarism by synonymizing their text, or indeed using machine learning to find different things. So it, it's always going to be a rat race, unfortunately, between the organized networks of fake producing papers. Um, and, and publishers trying to safeguard, you know, what comes in and, and, and catch these things. Um, yeah, there's always more that can be done, I'm sure, as we will find out of new ways that people are going to fraud. But I think most of these measures should be hopefully enough to prevent the very egregious cases of, of misconduct. But who knows, people are going to find new ways. I think from my perspective as a person who reports these papers, I would be um, sometimes wishing that I would get a little bit more update and a little bit more faster investigation of cases because I, there are several papers I re have reported to a range of publishers where you know I published I reported them five, six, seven, eight years ago and and these papers still have not been corrected or retracted and so I think from my end my my wish list would be that there is a little bit faster. Uh, retractions of the of the cases that really look like it was horribly photoshopped and have publishers and journal editors be a little bit more um, how do you say independent of the author's responses and a little bit more or, or institutional investigations which can take years because there's just a couple of papers well many of them from my perspective because I focus on them Papers that have so, the problems in those papers are so big that it doesn't really matter what the authors say. Like, I feel those papers should be retracted, but that doesn't seem to be happening. So from my end, as a whistleblower, there is some frustration about the lack of response, at least what it seems, uh, uh, you know, to for me. It might be that the publishers are working hard behind the scenes. It just seems to me that nothing is happening. So a little bit more communication between the people reporting these papers and uh, whether or not uh, there's an investigation going on would be much appreciated. I, I hear you, Elizabeth, and I could give you a very long answer, but I'm not going to <laughs> sure. give you a short answer. And that is, you know, when the authors are denying everything or if they are giving us uh, explanations which could be valid but we don't know because we haven't looked at research books we don't know what the you know the original source data are saying we, we rely on others to investigate and yeah. it's usually yeah. the university and as you already pointed out that can be a slow and cumbersome procedure and because we work in a world which I agree with which I think is the right way where you are innocent until proven guilty it does sometimes take, it's much harder, much longer, there might be legal involved. There is, some of these cases can be very, very complex, but I absolutely hear you. And we are trying to get expressions of concern on when we feel we can do that, but it's not always easy. 
Mm-hmm. Elizabeth, I could talk to you all day, uh, and I'm sure we, there is so much more we could explore, but um, I'm going to bring this um, conversation to an end. It's been um, my huge pleasure to have uh, had the privilege to to actually speak to you because you were always an email in my entire <laughs> research career, an email away. Um, and I'm going to leave you with one last question. So... If you had one wish uh, where you could change only one thing, what would that be? Uh, well, and I assume we're going to talk about research integrity. I have many wishes. but <laughs> um, I, I, I wish there were a little bit more consequences for people who have been caught and proven to, to be guilty. Um, there are, you know, it's... it's it seems that there's very little consequences, uh, especially when senior people are being caught doing this and proven to be guilty. There, uh, there should be consequences because if you know, if you think about a world where um, you there weren't any fines to to speed uh, or to run a red light, like in traffic, if we didn't have any rules or consequences or fines, I think a lot of more people would be speeding and running red lights with all you know consequences. There, yeah, I do feel there should be some rules and punishment that just punishments is a big word, but like consequences for people's career if they're being caught and not just a, you know, um, a ban for applying for new grants, but, you know, maybe paying back grants or uh, bans to apply for a longer period or there, there's many things we can think of. And I do feel that some people should perhaps lose their job, not be in research anymore. If you are cheating, you're not a scientist. You're not doing science. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to our my, listeners. My absolute pleasure to be here, Rita. Uh, thank you so much. Um, until next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.